This is the Houndsman XP Podcast. Good dog, get that bear. Get that bear in here. The original podcast for the complete Houndsman. The podcast that represents our lifestyle of extreme performance. Get up there! Get him! Get him! Yeah! Good boy! Good boy, Ranger! Uniting houndsmen across the globe from east to west, north to south. You know, if you're going to catch a cat or a lion, you know, you have to have teamwork. We take you to the wildest places on earth. Yeah, so how many day how many days a week do you spend on that? As much as I can to be honest with you. Any time that I get, I'm I'm out there. Join us for every heart pounding adventure on Houndsman XP. I'll tell you like I tell everyone else, I'm gonna hunt whether you're here or not, so you might as well be here. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Josh Michaelis with The Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network, and today we are lucky enough to be joined by the legend himself, and that that's, that that word gets used a lot anymore, Shorty, but I, I think it's accurate this time. We're here with Shorty Gorham. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'm good. How about you? That's a, that's a big word there. <laughs> I, legend for maybe the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, that, we'll, no. we'll, we'll take it any way we can get it. <laughs> But uh, I talked to you all here about a week ago, Shorty, and what we're going to do, and I want to introduce you because, I mean, we've, we've been doing competition coon hunting on the truth ever since it started, and that's kind of been our focus and kind of been where we've went with that, and you're not a competition coon hunter. Uh, nope. You're, you're a big game guy. Uh, you're, a, you're a South Texas guy. Uh, you're as far away from the way that I train my dogs and the way that I hunt my dogs as I can think of currently. And so, uh, we want to touch on that and we want to touch, touch about, or talk about training pups and a few things like that. But Shorty, tell, tell all my listeners about yourself, would you? Well, yeah. Um, as far as, as far as the hunting goes, uh, you know, just like I said, I live in South Texas, but, um, and, and hunt a lot of bobcats down there and, and occasionally some lions. And then, um, uh, and then I also work out further west, um, and, uh, work for the, for the USDA. Mm -hmm. And so we're catching and collaring a lot of, a lot of lions and, and some bobcats and, and such. So yeah, my, my hound hunting world is, is mostly, um, like I said, South Texas bobcats and then Western, Western big game or, or mainly lions. So how's that bears in the past. So yeah. How's that been going? You've been catching a lot of lion. It's been going pretty good. Yeah. Well, we've been, we've been, uh, shut down since right before Christmas, mm -hmm. um, due, due to some technical technicalities with, with COVID and, and whatnot. And they got that all squared away. And so, um, fixing to get to go back to work here pretty quick. Good. Good. What kind of, uh, where'd you get your start? When did you start running hounds shorty? Oh, I started running hounds probably, Oh, 23, 24 years ago mm -hmm. and, uh, was, you know, just a rancher I had cow dogs and, uh, we started having depredation issues and, and losing a lot of calves and, and a couple of colts and, and whatnot. So, uh, figured I, we better start taking care of that before we went broke. So, yeah. um, contacted a friend that I knew that had some hounds and, and, uh, we went and started working on the problem and, uh, um, ended up buying some hounds from young hounds and, uh, and just went from there, just self, self taught the whole way. Yeah. Um, to didn't, didn't really know anybody that did it other than him. And, and he was real early in the game for himself too. Right. And so just, just learned it the hard way, you know, which I appreciate now it took longer to, to figure things out, but I think it, 
it sticks better once you do figure it out. I do think sometimes because there's there's and we'll just I'm just going to go off off the rails here for just a second about that. But I look at um, and yes, we should definitely listen to the to the older gentlemen that have been running mm-hmm. hounds for a long time. But just because you've got a lot of experience, don't mean you're not you're doing it right. You know what I mean? 100%. You know, and so some of these guys that have been doing it for a long time and, you know, you can see that and it's great that they're getting kids started and it's great that they're trying to help and they're great people and we support them. But sometimes it's easier. It's not easier, but sometimes it's more successful in the long run to do it like you did and just kind of learn as you go. No outside influence. You're, you can kind of look at things, you know, a little more unbiased and things like that. So maybe that is a better route in the long run. But like you said, it, it's got to be hard. It, yeah, it is hard. And, and uh, but I agree with you. Absolutely. There, you know, um, and nothing against um, guys. And there's, you know, there's some guys, heck, I've, I've got a great friend that, that uh, um, hunts hounds and he'd, he'd help anybody get started. Yeah. That, that wanted to get started or whatever, but he'll tell you, honest to God, he doesn't care if he ever catches anything. He just wants to right. hear his dogs bark, you know? And so right. if you get with the wrong guy early on, um, that if you're, if you're in a game to catch game, yeah. uh, and you're training under somebody that just wants to, to go out and hear dogs bark, um, you're probably not going to get to where you want to be anyways. My advice to a lot of them younger hunters and the guys just starting out, I don't care if it's beagles, bird dogs, coon hounds, competition side of it, just pleasure hunting side of it, whatever. Find somebody that, and I, I'm not above copycatting anything. You know, find right. some find somebody that's really good and that has the things that you want, the dog's style and, and, and the dog's, you know, well, the way the dogs do things, you know, you like it, you want it, that's what you want. Uh, mm-hmm. just, go, just go do what they do. You know, I understand exactly. that, you know, but, but make sure just because they haven't done it for a long time, you're not listening to every single word they say. <laughs> right. And you said a mouthful when you said style, I think yeah. that has a lot to do with it because my particular style may not fit a dog or that dog style may not fit me. And we're, if you're clashing, you're not going to, you're not going to be catching game like right. you should. You, you need to, I don't care how good a dog is. If I don't enjoy hunting that dog. I, I'm not going to hunt it. Right. And, and, uh, because you're going to be mad the whole time yep. and then your, your focus is shifted in the wrong direction. And it just, it just doesn't work for me to, to hunt a dog that I don't enjoy or, or that we clash. I know on my side of the sport, there's all kinds of handlers and dogs that there's nothing wrong with the handler. There's nothing wrong with the dog. Uh, they just don't get along. Yep. And that's a term that we use a lot. You know, I, I just can't get along with that dog. I uh, mean, that dog yep. don't see eye to eye. And yep. you got to recognize that, especially in our sport, you know, like you take our dogs and there's dogs of Jed's that I get along with. I, I can't handle shock. You know, shock's a platinum champion. Shock's a Bear Creek champion. He's done, he's won all over the place, talented coon dog. But yep. me, me and him don't get along and we never will. And I know it, he knows it, and we stay away from each other and everything. everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You, and somebody else handles that dog and kicks their butt with. Yeah. You that's, bet. You bet. Some dogs, yeah. some dogs and some handlers just don't see eye to eye. And that's something you got to recognize. But Shorty, mm-hmm. whenever you started, uh, you said you started with a guy that he hadn't been in it long. You hadn't been in it long. How long was it before you guys started seeing the results that you wanted, you know, or did, did your, did what you want change and evolve over those years too? Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted. You know, really, I I just I just knew I needed to 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 catch the predators that were that were killing my calves. And yeah. I didn't know. You know, I could tell you what I wanted in a cow dog at the time, but but no, I didn't know what I wanted. And you know, I started reading a lot and, and whatnot. And and uh, then there went a, a phase where I thought I wanted the coldest nose dog on earth you know mm-hmm. i i just wanted a dog that could really cold trail him. yeah and uh and that's that's changed over time you know and and um but yeah it took um well there was a lot of game at the time that i started so it wasn't long uh before i was catching game but um the uh the caliber of the, of the dogs, I think, has increased dramatically since then. Right. Um, and and it was, 
it was just what really changed was when I when I moved to South Texas and went to trying to catch bobcats. Yeah, and um, and I, the dogs that I had could catch lions, um, and they could catch some bear, but they couldn't catch a bobcat. And hey, sure. that's when I realized, hey, this isn't this is I got to do something dramatically different, and uh, and that's when I changed from uh from hunting the the kind of the western yeah style hound western big game hound to to hunting the running dogs and now i can catch bobcats consistently and 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 i can also catch lions consistently so that was that was a that was a game changer for me all right shorty we're going to take a commercial break right here and that's that's my just keyword for i forgot to change the batteries in my podcaster <laughs> <laughs> so, i'm gonna do that real quick you stay on the line i'll we'll get back with you just right here in a second all right ladies and gentlemen so we are back and uh shorty you were talking about how you had switched from the western big style or big game style dogs and had went more to the running dogs now to, yeah. uh, to us we got running dogs up here you know they're they're july foxhounds they're walkers running walkers whatever mm-hmm. you know is that what you got down there too Yep. Yep. Mainly, um, my packs, uh, mainly, mainly run and walker. Yeah. Um, so, you know, somewhere way back, they, they may have some, some, uh, trader July in them or, right. or whatever. Those, the guys down there just like hunting stuff that catches game. And, yeah. and so, you know, make maybe a little here or there, but not, not much, mainly run and walker. But, but, and the, the reason I switched was because I couldn't, I wasn't catching, you know, yeah. I just wasn't, I wasn't doing it. And so then I got to, to go with some guys from that country that were very, very successful bobcat catchers. Mm-hmm. And when you look around and see what they're hunting, you go, Oh, you know, maybe, maybe I need to try that. Yeah. I need some of that. Sure <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so look around, you know, for the young guys, look around if you're getting started in, in, in especially big game hunting because it mm-hmm. changes wherever what region you're in and stuff look at the look at the guys that are successful and what they're using and you might yeah you might want to start there and it, see it that, could shorten the process that applies to me too and applies to all the breeders of these eastern coon hounds which you, this may ruffle some feathers here but that's why the walkers are so dominant especially in pkc now winning all that money is because those guys aren't jealous Right. If someone's beating them and yep. and and putting some of that stock into their stock is going to improve their stock to where they can have an upper hand, they're going to do it. They don't care who owns it. They don't care, you know, what breed yep. it is. Even you know, you get Walker guys breeding a blue tick dog, and blue tick guys don't do that very often. You know, they're just right. red bone guys. They're kind of they're kind of factional, and they're maybe that's where we've got an upper hand and now we've got so many of the walker breed that we can choose from different strains and lines and stuff like that so we don't have to dip out as much as we used to but right. it uh that that was one of the things that really catapulted the walker breed over some of these others is because these guys winning that money they didn't care who owned it they don't care yep. how they if their dog was better they were just going to try to get some of it yep Yep, and that's how that's how I am. If I see somebody that's got better dogs than than what I got, I'm gonna figure out how to how to get some of that. Yeah, and part of that, shorty, is being honest with what you have. Yep, exactly. You know, I have I have a line of dogs that we're you know we're five six generations into, and I know what their downfalls are. Uh, I know what they need and and how they can get better. And if you don't know that, if you're blind to those things, you you're just never gonna get better anyway. See, and you guys probably have a leg up as far as that goes, if you're honest with yourself, because you're you're competing against people all the time. Right. So if you're not winning, it's telling you something. You know, we're like I do a lot of hunting by myself, yep. and I know a lot of guys that do hunt by themselves. And so you're not you're not able to see your dogs against other dogs directly. And we know? we me and Chris talked about that on our crowdcast the other day, and I said that one of the 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 detriments that big game hunters have, bear hunters, lion hunters, bobcat, whatever, is they, they don't have a way to compete. Right. And I, th- right. and we, you know, I've said that I think our dogs are the pinnacle of what you can do with a hound and all that stuff. And that got blew out mm-hmm. a little, blew out of proportion a little bit, but 
Uh, I feel like it's not because our dogs, you know, are just, we're just great houndsmen or anything like that. I feel like we have a platform to compete against each other where you guys don't right. yet, you know, and that yep. would be, it would be so hard to do. Sure. You know, so exactly. I think that's just one of the reasons that, you know, it's harder to breed top. And I will say, I think it's harder to breed top notch, uh, big game dogs. You know, if you're trying mm-hmm. trailing a lion track in the Southwest on the dry ground, it's hard to get a pup to do that because you're, you don't have a track every 200 yards of the game you're wanting to deal, to deal with. Right. You have to take a track and that's the only track you're getting. And that dog's got to really put its nose to the grindstone and finish that track. So that's got to be yep. hard for starting a pup. Yeah, they, 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 uh, hunting in situations like that, they just got to love the trail. Yeah. You know, and that's, it's, I do, I think there's coon dogs in, in, and I'm not a coon hunter. I never have been. I, I've been coon hunting a little mm-hmm. bit, but I, I've never seen what you guys do in your competitions or anything like that. But, but to me, the big game hound, there, there's, so many more layers that a big game hound has to have versus a coon hound, okay. you know, and it's, and it's all parts, it's all steps of the, of the process. Just like, like that, like you go in, in some desert Southwest country, mm-hmm. um, and you, you have a, maybe a, a track every few days. They got to love to, to, uh, you got to love the trail. Yeah. Well, you can get a dog to love the trail so much that they never do pick their head up and, and, and on jump game mm-hmm. and, and push it hard enough to put it in a tree. So they got to be able to, to do that, you know, and then, and then, you know, you, you may be in bluffy, uh, terrible rugged country and the dog has to also want to catch the game so bad that they'll figure out how to get through it, but smart enough that they're not going to get themselves killed doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then, and then they got to be, uh, tough enough and have the stamina enough to, to deal with that heat and, and bad dry conditions. And, and you're in terribly rocky country and they got to have tough feet and, yeah. um, you know, there's just layer after layer after layer that, that they have to have, they got to be, you know, multidimensional to, to be a complete big game hound. You know, I, where. I love that you used the term layers because that is one of the arguments that I made against Chris is that we have more layers. <laughs> I got so, you. so, uh, yeah, I love it. Uh, look, we're going to touch on that later. I want to talk about that before the end of this podcast about the layers and stuff like that. But one of the reasons I had you on here and I want to talk about training pups and mm-hmm. I want to, I want to talk about what we're looking for, uh, how your style and your game differs from the way that I'm going to start a coonhound pup in the east. And right. there there's I think uh we we we've talked about the differences a bunch, but I think there's a lot of similarities too. I think we're looking for sure. You know, a lot of the same things. So, say mm-hmm. short, Shorty Gorham is going to breed. We're going to start right from the beginning. Shorty Gorham's got a real good female. Real good top-notch uh female. Yeah, she's got she's got a, most of the traits that you like because I've never seen a dog that has all the traits that we like. Right, and so she's got most of the traits that you like. She's a five or six year old dog. Uh, she, you, you got a good chance to breed her. She's in heat right now. What are you looking for in a stud dog? Well, um, so uh, most of my my pups are out of um, one or two stud dogs, and and I partner with a guy on on our dogs, and mm-hmm. um, and so both of those stud dogs and it's just our style yeah but both of those stud dogs are are uh very very smart dogs that um hunt big and wide mm-hmm. and which i think that's something you guys look for as well yes. but um they you know they hunt big wide pretty fast um but cold enough nose that they're not missing a track mm-hmm. um and, and really honest with their mouth. And, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, just some of the stuff that I'm, I'm looking for, but, but mainly the dog's got to be smart. They got to have brains and, and 
um, that's something that on these on the Bobcats, uh, if they don't have the brains, you're gonna get your butt kicked time and time again. And that's that's why I I like um, I like running the Bobcats for that reason because mm-hmm. they will they will tell you where your dogs are at. You know, your if, if your dogs are screwed up, you they'll let you know. Yeah. Um, they're just too tricky. So, but yeah, no, I I want a dog that that, that hunts big and fast and. Uh, um, the reason that, that I want that is not for competition purposes, but, um, when you go in rugged country, I personally feel like the more dogs you have out there scattered out, the more chances of hitting a track, you know, I want, yeah. them, I want them scattering out like a shotgun and, and, uh, so when you turn, when you turn your pack loose, you, you kind of favor them to go different directions. Yep. Okay, yeah, so well, I mean, I don't really favor them. I just get you know, just get on right mule and start riding, and they just go different directions. I got you. So you, uh, so that's great. You want them to fan out, you know, co- yep. that way they cover more ground. Um, yep. When one of those dogs gets struck, and, and mm-hmm. it's a pretty good track, do you want the other ones to go help it? Do you want them to kind of keep hunting where they're at, or what do you want? Uh, I nope, I want them to go go to them. Okay. Um, and then, and then. Um, uh, what works for me, um, especially on the Bobcats, when those dogs get to those other dogs, um, I like to have a few dogs in that pack that are kind of tighter trailing dogs, mm-hmm. going to stay closer to the track, and then the rest of them kind of out looking. Okay. You know, and and um, and they can they can move that track faster if they do that. The, right. The, thing is the the closer trailing dogs gotta honor the other dogs if they pick it up ahead i got you and and that's how in in terrible conditions you know real dry uh powdery dirt not much grass um dry just dry dry that's the that's the way we can push these bobcats yeah. fast enough to to get them to tree now we were talking about stud dogs. I just wanted to touch on that um, mm-hmm. tracking stuff first. But we were talking about stud dogs. So you, you've got a couple stud dogs. You got a good jip. And I also want to emphasize, and me and you have talked about this on the podcast before on the Monday episode. You don't. There's no such thing as a brood female. Uh, no. You know, not to me. We, we breed good dogs to good dogs. Me and you agree on yep. that. And we like to stack yep. up generations of good dogs behind them. Mm-hmm. and we both feel that's the most successful breeding program you're going to have and so we're just going to skip that part but you you, right. you got her bred uh she has six healthy pups three males three females standard litter how many of them pups out of those six are going to make not top notch world class you know big game hounds but just just a serviceable dog it, it's gotten better and better over the years um you know uh before uh if i got one or two of them i was i was happy now right. um let's say the I'm trying to think of the last litter we had um the last litter we had all but one pup worked yeah um and and really uh he was a freak of nature really cold nose could take mm-hmm. anything that that the other dogs couldn't take and just run off with it but um he barked out of place a little bit yeah and a lot of people won't believe this but in in certain parts of the country especially where we're at we in a droughty uh time of year or in a drought mm-hmm. um one one bark out of place can cost you catching a bobcat. Really? Yeah, yeah. It, if it takes them, they can't make a mistake to catch them in in those tough conditions yeah. like that. And if, if that if that one bark out of place pulls those dogs too far off the track, I and it takes you. them too long to figure it out, you just bought that cat a few minutes. And yeah. And so you when you're when you're up. talking about barking out of place, you're talking about a dog that opens its head when it's not right on that cat track. Yep, okay. exactly. Because our barking yep. out of place is just straight babbling. 
you know, we don't like gotcha. it. We don't like it either. We, we, right. me and Jed and, and the guys that I hunt with and around, we hunt pretty silent dogs. They don't bark a lot on the ground. And that's right. not a big deal for coons. I love hearing a race just like anybody else. And I've had dogs that open, you know, wide open on the ground too. And I like it if they sound good, but yeah, mm-hmm. most, most of our dogs are pretty quiet. So we've got barking out of place. That's a hole that, is that a hole that is an absolute no go that you can fix? Is that something that you can train out of them? Or is that I something that, try. yeah, that's something if they do it and then that sucks and we'll just give it, yep. give it away and get a different one. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Because that's, that's, um, that's a flaw that I think uh, can be carried on throughout genetic generations, and and I'm not going to breed that dog, so I don't even I don't even mess with it. You know, yeah. I I like to have, and you you never do, but I like to try to have every dog in my pack that I would that I would breed. Right. You mm-hmm. know, if not, yep. I I'll spay them or neuter them and sell them, and and it may be really really good dog but just not something i would breed right for one for one reason or another we have and we, we talked about pups and you said you know five or six of them made serviceable big game hounds mm-hmm. out, out of you know pretty good percentage make dogs that, that will work in a pack of some sort they may not be your style they may not be exactly right. what you want what about do you get one out of that litter or two that is exactly what you want on a consistent basis yeah so the last um the last couple litters that we've had um have been you know uh there's four of those dogs and i think there was seven in the litter on the mm-hmm. last litter four of those dogs are exactly what we wanted yeah. well, that's pretty um, good. <laughs> yeah and and of the litter before that it was about the same yeah so and the other the other two are are damn good dogs you know they're just uh maybe for a reason we're not going to breed them but there's four dogs in that in that last litter that we're definitely planning on breeding when uh you get them you raise them pups at your house you raise them pups you're around them pups i assume quite a bit yeah yeah raise them i raise them as soon as they're big enough that uh feel like they're not going to get run over by a truck yeah uh you know just they're on the ranch um I kick them out and they live, they live loose on the ranch to do whatever they want, whenever they want to. Yeah. And, you know, it gives you an opportunity to watch them. Um, and it, it's funny. You'll, you'll see them. They'll be laid out up by the kennels, just dog tired. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then all of a sudden you'll be down at the barn or, or at the arena or wh- whatever. And you'll see them pups get up and start trotting out into the field. And then pretty soon, they got a race going and I'll drop what I'm doing and run over there and try to listen and watch them and, and yeah. evaluate them there. And, and, uh, and quite honestly, that's where my colon starts yeah. is when they start running tracks. Um, and, and I think those, their style and their, their, you know, that, that barking out of place, mm-hmm. it starts to the end and yep. it, it'll continue all the right. And so if you see it then, you know, yep. there's no use in continuing on with that pub, but it, it, it gives me a great, great opportunity, um, to, to evaluate those pups. I've always said on my letters that, and I've, I've, by the time they're three months old, three and a mm-hmm. half months old, I can tell if I'm going to like them or not. Right. And right. I've not been wrong yet now i've had some at you know weaning time that i'm not sure about and i don't there's some things i don't learn that have turned up but usually by the time they're three three and a half months old especially and i let mine run loose a lot too i've Mm -hmm. got a big uh, acre pen that they that they grow up in and then they're turned loose out of that every day and you know i just watch them they i turn them loose they're loose all night long i like you know because we do all our hunting at night and this may be uh Uh, something that's pointless or whatever but i don't like to turn them loose until dark you know i don't care if it's they're just weaned or if they're whatever you know Mm -hmm. i just i just like to turn them loose at dark i think that gets them in a in a rhythm you know that they're gonna have to hold out throughout their whole career so so yeah you can tell uh so you you're looking at the same thing you know three three and a half months old you can usually tell if these pups are going to be what you need or what you don't um Usually it's a, it's a little bit later than that. Yeah. Um, for me, um, 
usually usually probably five six months old. Yeah. Um, before they're because uh, I just leave them loose all day every day, so right. they you know they may um all this one may be running stuff this time of day and that one's running stuff that time of day. So I don't, yeah. if I turned them loose like you do, yeah, it would probably be a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, but I just, I just leave them out there all, all the dang time. I figure that way, if they want to run something, they can run some, but yeah. then they start getting, they start grouping up, mm-hmm. um, you know, five, six months old, like I said, you'll go down there to, to the kennels and they'll be, They'll be all just laid on their side. You walk right over the top of them. They don't even know you're there. They're so tired. And then, but when, when I guess it's the game starts, but whatever tells them dogs to all of a sudden haul up, will jump up at the same time. And they'll trot off out there to the field. And boom. Next thing you know, they got a rabbit going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's when I can, I can start to pick them apart. And we, we come on here to talk about the differences in training. And one thing that I think makes, what we do difficult. Now I'm not saying we're, we're, let's get this out there. Now I'm not saying training a, a competition coonhound is more difficult than training a lion dog or a bear dog or whatever. I'm not, but one, we talked about layers earlier and one of the mm-hmm. layers that we have to have are independence. Like you were talking earlier, uh, you got dogs fanned out. One of them starts a track. You want the other dogs to go over there and honor that track. That's one of the biggest absolute no nos we have. Right. If you're over here and you're doing your own thing, and you hear a dog barking, and you, you pay enough attention that you want to go over there and see what that dog's doing, that's terrible for us. And so right. how we start these pups, I want to get mine. I'll, I'll pick one out of every litter, uh, mm-hmm. and I try to get it picked by the time it's six, seven weeks old. So far, I've done pretty well. Most of them have been coon dogs they or dogs that would treat coons. Now, not a lot of them have been right. coon dogs because that's hard to get. But uh, we have to encourage independence from the time that they're eight nine weeks old until we retire and it's right it's frustrating and it's hair pulling because a dog don't want to do that right and the ones that do are super weird right. uh, the dogs that want to be alone all the time and we've we've bred them this way for so long you'll get those two uh say they're treated and a dog just comes in to cover them or back them and they'll leave you know they they have mm-hmm. they have just as many problems with the dead loner as you do a dog that wants to pack. And so it's a fine line that we ride all the time, but like we, we take these pups from the time they're babies. And if they get in a dog box, they get in a dog box by themselves. I still won't haul two dogs in the same side of a box if I can help it. You know, I'm, they're constantly alone. They're constantly looking to me as an alpha, as a pack leader, as opposed to any other dogs. You know, I don't want them. I don't even want them sniffing each other's butts when they're running around out in the yard. And it's just, it's, we enforce that for so long. And a lot of these guys think that we're making these dogs independent by just, you know, using an electronic collar, you know, an e-collar right. whenever they're coming in, we're, we're giving them a little buzz or, or we're, we're giving them some correction when they come into other dogs. And if you do it right, you don't have to do that. Sure. Uh, it, we never reward a dog for, for treeing with another dog. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't care if it's a, three-month-old pup on the first time we've ever turned it loose and it runs in with the old dog and trees with it and just trees its full head off and it's got a coon and everything we're not going to let it touch that coon right under under no circumstances would we ever reward a dog that didn't do 100 percent of the work on the both the track and the tree and so it's a long long tedious process that continues throughout the dog's career which is usually our male dogs, you know, by the time they're five, they're usually burnt out and done. Uh, our females right. go, go a long ways into the career. We hunt them. Our females now are six, seven years old, and they're still winning. So it's just such a different aspect there that we have to yeah. do as opposed to what you guys have to do. But also, uh, when you guys are talking about operating in a pack, there's got to be challenges there, too, because we don't care about tree habits. We don't care if a dog's mean at a tree. We don't care if a dog jacks a tree. Right. We don't care if a dog is pleasant around the feed bowl or is pleasant around dead game. We don't care. I mean, we that right. dog can be as, frankly, that dog can be pretty rough. As long as it doesn't follow dogs around, we honestly don't care. So you guys right. got to look at a pack mentality, and, and you got to have pack stability, too. So you guys can't have, like, a rough dog or anything like that in there. Well, that's, and that's one of the challenges, you know, just let's use bear hunting. Um, yeah. for, for example, a bear dog has to be, do all the other, have all the other layers that we talked about, but then they've got to be 
extremely tough mm-hmm. uh, dogs. They got to be able to get their butts kicked one day and, and the next day go back and get in a bear's face. Right. Um, so they have to be tough, gritty, gritty dogs. But if that dog is, like you said, if that dog is growly or, or mean to other dogs at a tree, you can lose your whole pack in yeah. a hurry. You know, they'll, they'll kill each other under the, under yeah. the tree. So yeah, that's another challenge is to get, get that extreme tough, rugged, greedy dog. That's, that's not rally or, or fighting to yeah. the other dog. Houndsman XP is very proud of our partnership with the organization freedom hunters. Freedom Hunters is a nonprofit organization that takes America's veterans hunting from field to field, from the battlefield to a field near you when you volunteer your time to take America's warriors hunting with you and your hounds. It's easy. Go to houndsmanxp.com, click on the partnership tab, and it will take you to Freedom Hunters. You can go direct to their website to make donations at freedomhunters.org. Support America's heroes. Let's pay it back. Visit Freedom Hunters at freedomhunters.org or go to houndsmanxp.com and you can find them on our website from field to field. What, what, uh, we're talking about grit and you're talking about stamina and you're talking about endurance. And that's, we've preached that just as much. The first thing I know I've had, I don't know how many big time winning handlers here and I'll ask them, what are you looking for in a dog? What are you looking for in a dog? And they always say the same thing first is always heart. Right. They got to have heart and they got to have drive. And now our, our heart and drive is different than yours. It, it mm-hmm. really is. You guys got to have stamina. You got to have a dog that's built just right to take, you know, all the miles. How many miles, say you hunt one hard day, how many miles is your dog putting in on a Garmin? Well, uh, the, the most miles I've had a dog put in, um, was 59 miles. Yeah. In, in, in full nights, uh, we started before dark and, uh, I think, I think Chris was there on that mm-hmm. deal. Um, dog I've got by the name of Mitch and, and, uh, and man, we had a hard time getting a track and we hunted all night and almost into lunch the next day. And when we loaded them and the dog still had, still had some, you yeah. You go to him, you know, but, um, I looked at that deal and yeah, that dog had gone 59 miles. Yeah. That's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had yeah. a real super hard night tree and coons where we're hunting, you know, dark to daylight. Uh, and then we're going in for breakfast in the morning. You're looking at 17, 18, sometimes as high as 25 miles if you're hunting in the winter, you know, and that's extreme in a four hour, yeah. in a four hour night, a three hour night, we tree six, seven, eight coons and, and we go in, which is pretty typical. Uh, you're looking at six miles, you know, five or six right. miles in dogs right. are covering, but we also leave our dogs treed for a long time. And right. what people sure. don't, what people don't understand is leaving a dog treed for an hour is burning a lot of calories. Some dogs, mm-hmm. some dogs run all night because they're too tired to tree. You know, we've had them wore out to where they don't want to make a tree because it's just as hard to work as it is cruising through the woods at six, seven, eight miles an hour. Right. And so right. it's, it's a little different, but what I like to talk about is our mental grit and mental toughness mm-hmm. of our dogs because they're, they're hauled up and down the road. Uh, they never stay in the same place for very long. Uh, they're not home a lot. You know, they spend weekends in the dog box and on the road, and then they're hunted through the week in different places trying to get ready. A lot of guys will go to a hunt and tune it up at the hunt location. Uh, they may be in Mississippi on Saturday and then be up in Michigan on Thursday. And so there's a lot of different trains, a lot of different dogs, a lot of different people. And when you take a dog that has been encouraged to be alone all its life, and then you turn it loose with three strange dogs, three nights a week, you know, and then you're hunting it with other dogs that it may know the other two or three nights a week that you're hunting. I think it just burns them out mentally. I think they just, sure. you know, they, they don't know what you want. There's too much pressure. You know, if dad wants me alone, why am I with the, all these dogs all the time? And so I think our toughness is, is on the mental side more than it is the physical side. Right. And do you, 
Because, I mean, you, you hunt a lot of different places and a lot of different terrain. Do you see your dogs change as you change places? You know, does it take them a while to adapt and all that stuff like it does ours? No, um, I I don't, I haven't, but, um, but I'm also coming out of country that's, uh, you know, the, the country I hunt is tough. It's, yeah. it's, um, if it's not a drought, you're either coming out of a drought or going into one. Right. <laughs> it's, you know, so th- that dry, dry, dry conditions all the time. Um, and, and that, I think when I go somewhere else, so I, I've yet to see them, um, struggle and, and, um, I think it's just because they're used to dealing with, with something tough and, yeah. and it's just part of their everyday life. And when they go, I, oftentimes when I go somewhere other than home, the trailing conditions are just getting better. Right. And so, um, so, but, but, uh, where I have trouble is, um, is taking them from that hot, arid country. I'm oftentimes also getting colder. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, I think as much of the dogs learning to adapt to that is me learning to how to, how to handle them to, to their fullest potential. You know, I, I don't like leaving them in the, truck all night if okay. i can help it so i you know i leave them on uh we'll plug our sponsors the uh, dogs are treed yeah. um i love their you know i don't even know what it's called but we call yeah, it yeah their tie out system. Yeah. Pick yeah. Them off, pick yeah. lines so yeah. but um but i leave them on that as much as i can so that they can go to the bathroom when yeah. they can but then if it gets down towards too too cold i gotta put them in there or they're just out there burning calories all yeah all night so think a lot of it for me um and my dogs and 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 it it may well have something to do with their they're always with their buddies too you know but that's one thing i was going to touch on do you think that it's because you know in a pack setting if there were three or four or five kennel mates everywhere they go and they can kind of lean on that dog i just think it takes some of the pressure off of them I, i i would agree with that yeah yeah i would it's you know it's just like uh you know you go stay alone for long enough and starts wearing on you mentally and and when you get to be around your buddies or your family or or whatever it just seems more uh more relaxing yeah where uh how far do you take i mean you, you're hunting them lions out west and you're hunting bobcats you live in south texas yep and uh do you where do you hunt your your lions at most of the time oh uh new mexico arizona yeah. and then um uh, work is, work is in California. Right. So, so I mean, um, you're, you're hauling them away. It ain't like they're just, you're oh, yeah. just going a couple hours down the road and turning loose on lines no. and then bobcats around the house. No, it's, it's, yeah, we go a long ways. And then, um, you know, when you're, you're at work, you're, we hunt every day, um, and, uh, staying in, you know, in camp where, yeah. where there's no kennels, no, nothing like that so have you had uh, have you had a dog that was really good around the house that wouldn't haul or have all yours hauled pretty good um no they they've all hauled pretty good and i again i think that's yeah that's because uh um you know they're they're with their buddies and and like my my setup for the for the most part there's um each compartment in my kennel uh, like my truck i hunt out of at home it's it's one it's just a full box you right, know the whole right. bed of the truck but then my other ones are anywhere from three to five dogs in a in a box so they're yeah. they're always got their buddies and and you figure out which ones you know if there's two of them that um well like for i've got an older female she's and and those dogs when they get older they want their room in the box and yeah. they don't want other dogs laying on them and whatnot yeah. and so uh, I'll put her, you know, maybe only with one other right. dog where they've got room just right. so they, it's less stressful on all of them. I think when they're, when they're trying to get room in that box, it, 
it stresses the whole pack out. Yeah. One thing I wanted to touch about, we'll, we'll backtrack a little bit on the, the pup training. When do you start exposing your pups to the dog box and going up and down the road and turning them loose, you know, in an older dog setting? Man, I, and I probably don't do it the right way, but I'll, I'll leave those dogs loose, um, until, until they start getting onto the neighbors yeah. or getting close to the, to the highway. And then, yeah. And then that's when they, um, their training starts yeah. really, uh, you know, they've been training themselves the whole time, but I, I take them from there. I put them on a, a chain mm-hmm. and they learn, they learn to tie and they're on that for a few days. And then I've put them on a leash, a long, a long line with yep. a, with yep. a Garmin collar and teach them what tone means and, yep. and, and teach them what the, the stimulation means and, mm-hmm. and that, and then, once I get them to where they, when I tone them uh, or stimulate them, they turn and come directly to me. Then they go in the truck, right. and I'll usually, you know, I've, I've got the whole. Uh, say we got six pups. I'll take one the first day, and and that dog um, will go with the the other dogs. And once it learns kind of how to function. I may hunt it two, three, four days with pack, and then I throw another one in yep. there. And I do the same thing, and then another one, and then another one. Within short time, I've I've got them all all in there and, and learning what it is. And the only way you can do that though is you, you better have some broke dogs. Yeah. Do you um, do you do most of your hunting at night? Yes. Okay. Yes. Have you noticed a difference between these young dogs turning them loose with dogs in the daylight versus turning them loose in the dogs in the night about how they go hunting? Uh, I haven't, okay. I haven't, but you know, I just, I think it's cause they, they've already run in a pack yeah. Yeah. their whole life and they've run day and night. So I, yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah. And we start my typical and every pup's different, you know, just as well as I do that you're going to have to do certain different things with certain dogs. But as mm-hmm. far as my training program, which I don't really want to call it a program, like I've wrote it down, but, right. uh, you know what? At an early age, I expose them to the dog box and I expose them to being in the truck and being away from home as early as I can, eight, nine, ten weeks old. And then as soon as they're old enough to get around, you know, uh, across a creek, across a ditch, stuff like that, you know, I'd turn them loose at night with with an older dog, uh, usually just one. And Mm -hmm. sometimes them, I've had pups that can't keep up, but they're out there anyway. You know, they don't care. They'll they'll bust a hole in the dark, and but most of them are going to be kind of hanging around you. And so for those right. first two months, say from four to six months old, I just want being in the dog box and being turned loose at night with an older dog to be fun. You know, there's mm-hmm. no, there's no correction for barking in the box. There's no correction for any yeah. of that stuff. You know, I try not, which sometimes I lose my temper with a dog barking in the box, but <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> whether, whether I say <laughs> I'm going to make it fun all the time, I sometimes I, <laughs> you know, I may, I may, tri- I may break that rule if a pup gets crazy, but uh, you know, I try to make it fun for them until they're six months old and at six to seven months old, you know, them jokers, they're old enough and they're athletic mm-hmm. enough. They can be out there. They don't need yep. to be standing by me, you know, right. so I don't get on to them for that. You know, it, most of them are going to go two or 300 yards out there with the old dog. They're going to turn around and come back immediately as they get back, they're on a leash and they're either tied to the truck or they're in the dog box. You know, right. if you don't want to go hunting, you're not going to stand out here and play. And so yep. we enforce that until they go hunting good. And the minute that that dog looks like it's interested in, in the game that we're chasing, which is coons or any game, mm-hmm. really. I mean, we get a lot of trashy pups that want to run deer, want to run whatever coyotes. Sure. Uh, we start hunting them by themselves. And yep. the minute that they get good at tree and coons by themselves, we go back into turning them loose with dogs. And I know, you know, we haul them alone. We deal with them alone. But once they've treed 40 or 50 coons alone and we know they're good at it and we know they have the talent, they never Mm -hmm. get turned loose alone again. Gotcha. Because we can't work on anything. I can't work on a dog that covers if I'm only turning it loose alone. A a dog that's a dead loner wants to be alone. So it's having fun out there coon hunting, but you're not, you're not putting any pressure on it. So you don't know how it's going to react when you put it in a cast, you know, we're paying entries that are $4,000, $6,500 
you know, you want to know what your dog's going to do in a crowd before you drive down to Mississippi and drop four grand. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, so there's certain stages to this. And I think that's one of the similarities that we have is you have stages too with most of your pups. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it sounds like you're going from running loose on the farm, which a lot of us do. I do that. Right. Uh, my brother, he just turns them all loose and whichever one starts treeing first, that's the one he throws in the kennel. Right. You know, and then the rest of them, they get sold. And I so, gotcha. um, there's layers, you know, as far as, or stages, as far as, you know, you, your pups are running. Now they're getting a little wild. We need to get them in the dog box. We need to get them in the pack. Yep. And I know with us, you know, throughout their career, Duds is 10. And if he goes and backs a dog, I would probably still get on to him. You know, it, right. it just seems like I'm always working and we're always training. And, it, and that lasts throughout the dog's life. I assume it's the same with yours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, if, if it's something I think I can correct, I'm, I'm correcting it. If, if not, um, you know, uh, just get rid of them. Yeah. Um, you know, but, but yeah, I, I think, it, but it's gotta be way easier. You know, once you, my main thing, my main corrections are running trash Yeah. and, and from the first day, those those pups because those pups, i already know they run game yep. so first day they go hunting um and they go try to start uh trash i'll tone them back yeah you know and 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 kind of like a a warning and 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 i only do that for a little while and then we go to stimulation and and before it's pretty quick that yeah. i go i go pretty high yeah yeah um, i do too i start i start with the hard one yeah, I don't, I yeah, don't, because, I don't level it up. If I'm going to shock a dog, it, it needs to know. Yep, yep, it needs to know that, that deer hurts. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and, and and then and when I do that, and you you may see the same thing. I'll do that, and those those pups will get to where they're they where they were going out hunting, doing their own thing, trying to find their own track. Now all of a sudden, they're staying kind of close to the truck. Yeah, like they're, 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 they get tentative. Yeah. Yep. And then they, and then they loosen back up and then, and, but yeah, that's my main corrections are, are on, on, on running trash. And then, you know, if, a, if one's maybe barking a little bit more than I like, mm -hmm. um, I may, I may bump them a little bit. Yeah. Um, but if it's too much, then I just, I just don't hunt that dog anymore. I just, I think what I've seen in the, in the buck and bull world and in the horse world and, and stuff is genetics is everything. Yes. And you can only train so much, Yep. but the genetics carries the, it just carries everything. And so if I, if a dog has a, a flaw that I, you know, like I said, I, I may bump them a little here or there, but if it, if it goes further than that, I just don't hunt them anymore. Yep. So, yeah. And that's, a, that's oh. pretty similar to us. I know genetically we look for brains more than anything because we have to yep. have, we got to have trainability uh, because yep. we, we're constantly enforcing that independence. And so the dog mm -hmm. has to understand, has to be smart enough to understand what we need. Yeah. But also them dogs that we've bred to the point where they're, they're border collie smart or they're healer smart. They understand situations better than, than dogs did 20 years ago. Yeah. And so don't you think that one of my dogs don't understand when it's in a cast? I don't care how much I try to replicate a cast. And mm -hmm. so, so I can train oh, on yeah. a dog when they're smart, they understand when they're in a real cast and when they're not. Absolutely. And when we can't touch them in those casts, we can't correct okay. them. We can't correct them for nothing. And so that's why those dogs that are super smart and they get some age on them and they've been in some casts and they realize where they're at and they realize you can't do nothing to them. Yep. Well, that's when they make their mistakes. You know, right. they're, they're, I got a saying that said they're all good behind the house. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. You know, I've seen a lot of good dogs behind the house that you I couldn't take up the road eight hours and win with. Right, and right. So, no, I mean, I, brains is a yeah. big thing, and just that's just like you touched. Brains is such a big thing. It is. And I think every, well, most every uh, every Western big game hunter that I know would tell you the same thing. That would yeah. be the first thing they're looking for. Well, I mean, you talked about how you're going to you're gonna buzz a dog off some trash, and it's going to be a little tentative. It's got to have the understanding as to why you did that and right. it's got to sort that out internally before it can be successful yep. and if they have brains they ain't going to do that they're going to forget about that and they're either going to keep doing what they're doing 
or they're going to remember it to the point that it detriment it's detrimental to how hard they hunt or how move how they move. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, Shorty. Yeah, and you hope that the you hope that the because uh, that's that's what we're trying to breed for too. Yeah. Is, is, and these dogs that I'm hunting right now are are way 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 smarter than the dogs that I started with, but. Um, we're trying to get them, like you said, border collie smart. I yeah. like that term. Yeah. Um, and, but you hope that the, their prey drive. That's, uh, that's where we're struggling is overpowered. Yeah. yeah. We're struggling with, and it's like, this is why dogs in my side of it, you may get a year or two out of them. And the dogs that win late in their career are such freaks. Right. Because they have the brains and the drive and they have enough drive to overcome the fact that we're so we're putting so much pressure on them you know we're we're losing and uh, i'll be the first one to admit it and especially my line is i lost a lot of heart when i went to have these dogs that i could i could make do what i want i always said i could teach con to give me an alpha in an hour i could teach con how to deal five card stud (laughs) but with with that comes a lack of drive and that's why you know at six years old he's done you know, I can hunt right. him. I can hunt him behind the house and tree coons. I can turn the dog loose by himself in a place where he's comfortable. You can hunt all night. You know, it's not right. a heart thing as far as that goes. But he's just been burned out mentally, and he understands. You know, yep. and so it's a catch twenty yep. two that we're at, and we've lost some of that. And right. so I wonder if there isn't a crossover there. You know, with some big game stock. You know, right. to where we could implement some of that. Yeah, because we need it back. I mean, I'm, I'll be the first to admit we need it back. I mean, the dogs that are reliable are hard to come by. Yeah, yeah, and I would bet there. I bet there that there is some. Uh, um, you know, you think of the, and it's different. It's not mental abuse. It's physical abuse that these dogs right. uh, go through, um, and and do it day in and day out for years yeah. and years and years I, I would think um and then there that out crush you you almost get some hybrid vigor right in there as well so right and genetics is one thing we don't have the time for it on this one but i'd like to really touch on you touch on you with it sometime is genetics and how that plays a role in a dog's predisposition and how we can understand it because it's a lot easier i mean i assume some of your dogs are papered some of them not i mean i know the whole seven eight ten generations behind mine and yeah, all, all we, those dogs have genetic predispositions that i'm aware of before i ever before the pup's even born right you know right yeah and, and i would our dogs are papered yeah because their genetics are wrote down on paper but they're not registered right right but yes we do we we know uh you many, got a many, pretty good idea years. you got a pretty good idea what you're getting before they hit the ground is what you're saying yeah. just like we do yeah yeah absolutely Shorty, there's like, oh, we could go on for like six, seven hours. There's other stuff. I was gonna, I was gonna write down a whole list of things, but I, then I thought, you know, I've winged every single podcast I've ever done, and it's worked so far. Let's just do it. With Don't Shorty change too. Now. Yeah, I didn't write nothing down. I'm just, I just wanted to pick your brain about big game dogs and stuff because while I argue. Uh, I like to think that I know dogs, but while I argue, I also don't have any experience, especially dry ground stuff. You know, right. I've got experience running foxhounds here on coyotes. I've got experience mm-hmm. running some bears in Wisconsin, but I know every place and every dog and every handler and every game, it's all different. And so yep. we, we can't lump it all up. But uh, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about starting pups. And, man, I want to do this again one of these days, Shorty. We need to get together and maybe make this like a 10-parter. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, well, why don't you just come to lion camp and uh... – I will come we down to do Lion King, but I ain't, I ain't going to South Texas. I hate South Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I, we can use your help, man. <laughs> I tell you what, I done a job down from, uh, we went from Kingsville up to Robstown. And yep. then we went from Robstown to Corpus Christi. And then we took that highway from Corpus Christi, or from Corpus Christi to Robstown. And then we went up and took that highway from Kingsville all the way up to that little town called Agua Dulce. Yep. And yep. man, there's some great people in that area, and I liked a lot of them, but that is definitely not my style of country. <laughs> oh man, it was hot. Whew, it was oh, hot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we if you just come a little bit west, you'll you were you weren't very far from me. Yeah. And uh, but we're not near as humid as it. Over no, there. it was. Man, I was running my wipers every day at ten o'clock. It'd be a hundred degrees, yep. and I'd have to run the wipers. It was miserable miserable yeah. i can't believe anybody lives down there 
<laughs> oh, I couldn't do that either. That's too humid for me. Yeah. But no, we'll get together. I want you to bring them bobcat hounds. We got a lot of bobcats, Shorty. A lot. Perfect. I mean, we have a ton of bobcats, and I got the ground to hold the dogs. Right on. So I'm always up I, in new country. I, I want you to come up here. The tracking conditions will be good. Uh, we can't treat them. I've, I've had a hound that treats them. We've treated bobcats. We have. I mean, but it's accident. Yeah. And we can't turn a six-year-old broke coon dog loose on a, on a cat track and expect it to do anything with it. Yeah. I, actually, I actually tried that two winters ago. I took Duds and the, the Dream Female, and I mean, this track, it was five degrees out, and the wind was blowing like crazy. And uh, I seen this track in the fresh snow, and it was still snowing. And this track looked like it was about five minutes old. Right. So I run home. I grabbed the only two hounds I had in the kennel, and I thought, well, maybe if I put them on this hot track, they'll run. I wanted to tree it. And I put them on this track, and they Duds was like three and a half miles away from where I cut him on a coon, tree to coon, in the daytime. And mm-hmm. Dream, Dream was over here by herself a mile the other way, uh, treed on a den tree. I assume she had a coon, too. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> you know, well, I don't, I don't have the dog power to run a good— But we get some snow on up here, and we can cut tracks. And I promise you, we got a lot of cats. Right on. And I want, I really want to see some good bobcat dogs work. And I think I got the country to put them in. So, yeah, you come up here one winter when we got some snow on, we'll try it. Perfect. We'll do it. All right, Shorty. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to do this again. We got a hundred other things that we could touch on. I really appreciate you uh, calling in and sitting down with me. I know you're busy. And so I really appreciate the time you took. And uh, we're definitely going to do it again sometime. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Uh, This is Josh Michaelis with The Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network. There you have it, The Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network. And I don't know about you, but I love this portion of our show. Josh does a great job of boiling this stuff down and keeping it entertaining. There's a little bit of BS in there, but hey, that's what makes it entertaining and uh joking around and having fun on this podcast so before we get out of here you guys need to check out dogs are treed lauren's been posting uh our canvas hats we are out of stock of the red and the black out there it snuck up on us but we are going to restock maybe with a different style maybe with a different color maybe a couple different colors but anyway check it out at dogs are treed at dogs are and enter the promo code HXP20% off. We've still got the tan and the green hats over there. And uh, check out Dogs Are Treat gear, man. I'm telling you, it is the highest quality gear that you can purchase. You will lose their leash before you will wear it out. No more broken loops in the late round when you're, when you're needing a leash and it's back at the truck. No more taking your belt off because your leash broke. Check it out. DogsAreTreat.com. HXP 20% off at checkout. Get all that discount. Also, check out Rough Cut Company. Rough Cut is a new sponsor for us. We've been pushing them hard because I'm telling you, I looked at that product and I saw so many possibilities for it. Rough Cut will take your high-quality images, digitize them, and laser engrave those onto their own native hardwood that they harvest they grow it they harvest it they mill it and they turn it into these great pieces so check out rough cut company at roughcutcompany.com and if you're looking for to if you're looking okay I'll, i'll just boil it down like this if you're looking at taking your prizes your awards things like that to the next level for your houndsman banquets um for uh, these big money hunts for your premier events check out rough cut company they can hook you up and at checkout if you will use the code hxp 10 percent off you guessed it you get 10 percent off your order and and both dogs are treat and rough cut if you join us on patreon you will get a deeper discount for both of those companies high quality gear both places check them out